In our lab, we carry out brain imaging studies that give us detailed information about how very rapid processes in the brain are unfolding over time. We can do this by measuring the actual communication between brain cells. When brain cells talk to each other, they generate tiny electrical fields. And that's the kind of measurement that we can make. It's called EEG, or electroencephalography. First, we place some electrodes on the head. Then, we have a computer that can present stimuli to our participant. What you can see here, each of these wiggly lines is one of these electrodes that's on the scalp of our participant. Heather, can you blink three times, please? Nod your head for us, please. After we've recorded some data, we have to do some more things to it to get some information out. What we do is we chop up our data. We look at the brain's responses to those particular events. And then once we have those segments of data, we can average those segments together, and that's when we get what we call an event-related potential. These pictures of ERPs have been organized along a timeline that starts when some stimulus like that is presented. An early ERP, one that happens very soon in the processing stream, is one that we call MMN. It stands for mismatch negativity. The MMN happens around 100 milliseconds. In a study we just recently published, we focused on this speech disorder that's called apraxia of speech. Children with this speech sound disorder have been thought to have a disorder affecting the motor movements needed to produce speech. Recently, we looked to see whether children with apraxia of speech are really processing speech sounds the same way as their unaffected peers. What we do is this. We play a sequence of speech sounds. Pa, 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 ba, pa, 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 ba, pa. All those of you who heard two speech sounds there, when you heard the one that didn't match, right, the less frequent one, your brain gave an MMN response. In children with CAS, guess what we found? No MMN. So really, you know, this shows that children with CAS are not processing speech sounds the same way. It's not just about the motor movements but it's also about the representation in the brain of the speech sounds that they're hearing. For them, we need to approach intervention differently. We could also develop new and more appropriate interventions for children with particular kinds of speech disorders. And if we have access to tools like this that let us look below the surface at what's happening, then we can also see whether our interventions are really helping. Generations of behavioral research have brought us a kind of accumulation of experience, some insights, but I'd suggest that maybe it's time to start asking those questions in different ways. By collecting scientific data from rigorously conducted experiments, we can start to shed light on questions that otherwise cannot be directly evaluated. We work in a very multidisciplinary framework. Since we come from these varied backgrounds, we bring with us experiences and concerns that we want to elucidate through neuroscience for the benefit of others. Our investigations are conceived and designed with the intent to inform clinical or pedagogical approaches and to shed light on issues of social justice and equality. Through the kinds of research that we do, we're aiming for a clearer understanding of the reasons for those inequities, the barriers that people might experience when they're trying to access those resources. We're looking for more effective means to evaluate underlying mechanisms and an evidence base that will permit us to derive policy changes, changes in programming. We want to equip educators with the tools and the evidence that they need in order to be more effective to implement the best practices in their fields, to be both producers and critical consumers of the research. We want to find new ways to apply what we've learned about learning. We want to find better ways to evaluate how effective our approaches are using the most rigorous and objective means that we have access to. And this, I think, right there, that's the promise and the potential for educational neuroscience.
I think this evening for me really opened up a lot of, um, of questions and I see the research in this area just exploding. I think we're very fortunate to have someone like Karen Froud uh, in-house uh, that, that's doing this kind of research that's hopeful to solve some of the problems.